Gaining ground, the Taliban takes more territory in Afghanistan. A UN report says the group has more reach in the country than at any point since 2001. So how powerful is the Taliban and can it be defeated? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Dedi Nabugeda. After U.S. troops began withdrawing from Afghanistan in 2012, the Taliban readied itself for a fight. It's now been almost a year since NATO ended its combat operations, and the Taliban has been trying to reclaim lost territory. It briefly captured the northern city of Kunduz in September. More recently, Taliban fighters have focused their attention on the southern province of Helmand, a region British and American troops struggled for years to defend. Well, the group took control of Sangin district on Monday. Afghan troops are now trying to take it back. The Taliban has been trying to take Sangin for more than a year. That region produces most of the world's opium. That's a crop which helps fund the Taliban. And their advances in Helmand province, as well as elsewhere, have highlighted the weakness of the Afghani government forces. Now, the warning signs have been there for some time. In September, even before the latest Taliban offensive, the UN did raise its threat level for around half of the country to high or extreme. That's more than at any time since the American invasion in 2001. Just last week, a Pentagon report warned the security situation in Afghanistan would continue de to deteriorate in the face of a resilient Taliban. And according to the Long War Journal, the Taliban now controls 40 districts right across Afghanistan and it's contesting another 39. For more on this, I'm joined by our guests in Kabul, Urzala Ashraf Nirmat. She's a governance and civil society specialist at the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Washington, D.C. is David Sedney. He's a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, David also served as Obama's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And in Kabul, Habibullah Fauzi. He's a member of the Afghanistan High Peace Council. Habibullah was a former senior diplomat during the Taliban's administration in Afghanistan. Good to have you with us on Inside Story. David, uh, what does the potential Taliban takeover of uh, Sangin mean? Well, the Taliban offensive in all of Helmand province uh, shows that this is a continuing very important target, both for the money reasons that you mentioned before, but also ideologically. Helmand has been one of the centers of the Taliban strength since they began in the 1990s. If they can recapture that, that poises them to make further uh, gains in neighboring areas, particularly Kandahar. What do you put these gains down to, though, and how surprising are they when the UN says uh, that more than half of the districts in Afghanistan are rated as uh, being high? or uh, having an extremely high level of risk? I would not say these are surprising. Uh, the Taliban offensive, which started actually about a year ago, has been heavily focused on uh, Helmand as well as several other areas. The Afghan security forces have done well, but they are handicapped by limited air, limited firepower, limited intelligence, and they don't have the kind of advising that they need. The, the Afghan National Army Corps in Helmand does not have any full-time formal advisors, even though it is the youngest and least experienced of all the corps in Afghanistan. That was one of the major mistakes the United States made in its drawdown planning. As the German defense minister said when she visited Mazari Sharif last week, the NATO plan for withdrawal was too hasty and too ill-prepared. But David, here's the thing. In October, the top U.S. commander in Afghanistan, General John F. Campbell, said that the Afghan security forces, I'm quoting him here, have displayed courage and resilience and they're still holding. So uh, what you're saying is that what he's saying is incorrect. No, uh, not, not at all. <clears throat> they are showing courage and they're so, showing resilience and they're holding. How are they holding when the pressure? Taliban has made so many gains? <clears throat> they are holding in that they have always been able to retake area that have, has been lost. The battle to retake Sangin will be the biggest test of that so far. In Kunduz, it took them two weeks to, carry, to, to retake the city. If they can retake Sangin, then they will have held despite this pressure. However, this level of pressure and the lack of the kind of support uh, that I mentioned before uh, will put them at great peril in the year to come when I expect the Taliban offensive to get even stronger. History shows that insurgencies that have a safe haven, such as the Taliban have in Pakistan, have a very high rate of success. 
Uh, Habibullah, so what will happen in the year to come with the Taliban offensive mm -hmm. and how will they respond uh, to the Afghan security forces strategy to retake Sangin? Yes, I think uh, uh, this is not uh, the, the new offensive and also the new uh, issues. Uh, I think from 13 years uh, this thing going on that the Taliban uh, bringing a pressure to on on the government uh, capturing some district and also leaving uh, sometimes uh, uh, these uh, districts or territory. The main point is that uh, the people of Afghanistan, they after this, uh, they will not tolerate uh, these offensive and these war, and the people of Afghanistan really. Uh, they want uh, to have uh, peace and stability in their country. And I think uh, this war uh, is not the solution for the issue of Afghanistan, and also this is not in the benefit of Afghanistan or not in the benefit of the neighboring country. I think the government uh, of Afghanistan and the High Peace Council, uh, they're trying and they should try uh, to solve the, prob uh, the problem of Afghanistan basically with the Taliban and also with the neighboring country. And I think uh, the best way for, for that is uh, to start a negotiation with Taliban and continue that negotiation to understand uh, the position of each other and see the solution for that. We'll talk about uh, potentially upcoming peace talks in a moment, Habibullah, but just first on the military and what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan in the uh, sort of medium term over the winter period. How do you see the battlefield uh, panning out in the country between uh, the Taliban and security forces? Yes, you see that I told before that uh, the war is going on in 13 years and also uh, the situation uh, sometimes sometime became different. Uh, sometimes the war is increasing and some, sometimes uh, become little. And uh, yes, that is uh, the problem uh, to, to the uh, Afghan forces uh, that is the, the, they seeing the war in so many uh, provinces like Helmand, but I'm sure that uh, uh, the security forces will be able to defeat that uh, fighting and uh, I will uh, I am also hope that the people of Afghanistan will try uh, try to solve uh, the problem of Afghanistan and also the problem of war you say you're confident that they will defeat uh, they will defeat fighting, as, as you say, but there are a lot of questions about the ability of the Afghan security forces to do that, considering the gains that are made by the, uh, by the Taliban recently, Habibullah. But uh, let me put this to you. There's a Pentagon report that came out in December uh, saying that the security situation in Afghanistan has deteriorated uh, during this year's fighting season. Also, it says that ISIL, Daesh, is becoming a greater threat in the country and it's making inroads in the east. How big a threat is ISIL, in your opinion, for Afghanistan? Yes, you see uh, that uh, I told you that the problem is uh, not a new problem. This is from four decades Afghanistan facing the war. And, but now uh, but you ISIL see that, seems uh, to be Afghanistan a new problem. forces and also the Afghan go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, the expectation is, uh, you see, after the withdrawal of the foreign troops of, from Afghanistan, there was some expectation that the war will be increased in Afghanistan. But you see that uh, the Afghan uh, government, uh, they determining to defeat this problem. And also, Afghanistan uh, as alone, they cannot uh, defeat all this problem, but surely uh, the world community, especially United States of America, and also the others, uh, they will help the, the, the government of Afghanistan uh, to solve and also to, uh, to see the normal uh, situation in the future. Orzala in Kabul, do you agree with uh, what uh, Habibullah is saying in terms of the international community providing help to Afghanistan so readily, uh, it seems? And also, uh, what do you think of the threat of ISIL? Uh, well, first of all, I, I would like to say that uh, I, I would like to respond to some of the points that Mr. Sidney was saying. I mean, about the weakness or the assumption that the withdrawal was very rushed, I would like to ask the question of how long do you need to train uh, a country's army and a country's security forces? 
the American uh, and international community probably has had uh, their longest presence, their, their longest military presence in Afghanistan. It was over 15 years. And in 15 years, if they couldn't manage to you know, build the capacity of our ANSF, then I don't know how long further would it take to build that capacity. So I think it's not the question of the capacity of the Afghan forces. In my view, the Afghan uh, national security forces are capable enough to tackle with things in the range of the same level of support that they are getting. The problem we are facing with, whether it is with ISL or Daesh, or Taliban or any other anti-government forces is the financial, military, and political support that those forces are gaining and receiving from other countries. It's not an internal war. It's a war that has regional and international you know, dimensions. And as long as those dimensions are convinced to, uh, are not con Vince, to stop this uh, you know, uh, war in violence in Afghanistan, I don't see any real peace negotiation providing a result in Afghanistan between a, um, a couple of or a bunch of you know, Taliban commanders and the others, and I don't see any uh, security and safety uh, assurance for international actors involved in the case of Afghanistan. And beyond that, there is a very clear similar da danger that Afghanistan will again turn into the same kind of you know, tr terrorist training camps for uh, threatening the whole world. I think we have to uh, question, we have to more question you know, the, the failure uh, of not really uh, uh, finding a, 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 a genuine solution to uh, drying up the financial, political, geographical, and you know, uh, 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 ideological support that these forces are getting in order to fight the Afghan government. So what is the uh, way forward then? One more point I would then? like to right. also mention, uh, make here is, can I, can I just make one more point? Go because on. the, the, you, are, you were saying before that you know, there are over 40, uh, 40, 40 districts that are controlled by Taliban. I would like your audience to understand that the absence of government and government institutions or government influence in a district is not automatically or by default equals to uh, prisons of Taliban. We have a very weak governance uh, you know, institutions in our subnational you know, governance system, and that allows in the, weak, uh, you know, the weakness of the governance system in Afghanistan allows uh, or opens a space for any kind of anti-government forces to gain some forces. And, and when I say weakness, it's not necessarily the capability of the security forces, but all, the, all kind of you know, political chaos that the country is facing with in terms of the current government. The government of Afghanistan has a huge responsibility in front of them to first come to an agreement on a kind of a modality that they are building to, to make the, the chain of command very clear, who is responsible for uh, what, and how to like, provide you know, facilities and ammunition and food and supplies to people Okay, on but the is, the government, to very, is the government know, uh, up to that task? Is the government up to that task, Orzala? Well, the government claims that it is, but it has to prove to both the Afghan people and also to the international community. So far, it has been quite weak to prove that because constantly it was the case in Kunduz and it, it is indeed the case in, in, in Helmand that the government only started to respond when the noises came out of these places by the security forces that we need supplies, we need food, we need you know, ammunition. Uh, and if government clears that chain of comment, if government uh, uh, makes a, a more professional system to fight against terrorism, I think there is a chance for Afghanistan to win. But this fight will continue as long as there is, you know, as I mentioned, uh, uh, outside Afghanistan r resources that, that feeds up, whether it is Daesh, you name it, we can have all kinds of labels uh, putting on, on these kind of forces. But for these forces, the, the most important point to be made here is that these forces have regional and international support and we need to focus on drying up those resources if we really want to have a peaceful Afghanistan. Speaking of peace, David, stalled peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban uh, could potentially pick up early in the new year. This is according to officials. Are you optimistic about any peace talks? It doesn't sound like Orzala and Kabul is. I don't see any particular reason to be optimistic about peace talks right now, but I agree it's important that they be started and that avenue be tried. It's important that every, every avenue be tried. 
In response to the question about how long it takes to train a military force that Afghanistan needs, I would say 30 to 40 years. So we still have, they still have a long way to go uh, before they have that kind of training because for the first seven years uh, that we were in Afghanistan, we did very little of the kind of training that was needed. So the Afghan forces are really undertrained, under uh, resourced, and uh, don't have uh, the, particularly the kind of air power, intelligence support, and logistics support they need to su survive. Uh, in terms of the points that were made about the concern about support from Pakistan, I completely agree with that. Uh, while peace talks are something that are important to explore, most the most important step that Pakistan could take would be to stop allowing weapons, fighters, explosives to cross the border. If Pakistan would stop doing that, then the Afghan security forces would have no problem handling the Taliban. Uh, Habibullah, I'll, I'll cross over to you in Kabul in just a moment, but first, because I see Orzala uh, nodding her head, uh, would you like to respond to David? Um, well, I, uh, I, I definitely agree in terms of the uh, focusing on Pakistan, but let me say that Pakistan is not the only source of supporting anti uh, you know, anti-government or insurgent uh, forces in Afghanistan. There might be more than that, and we need to look into that, find those financial and, you know, political resources that, that funds these people. I, I personally uh, did not see any kind of clear evidence that drugs or money funds Taliban insurgency. Uh, there are rather other, uh, you know, uh, countries, other forces, maybe not governmental, but completely private, and there has to be a global mechanism to fight those uh, sources and to dry them up in order to really ensure a sustainable peace. Uh, Habibullah, speaking of the peace talks uh, with the Taliban and the Afghan government potentially early next year, uh, would there be a motivation for the Taliban to join any peace talks after the recent gains that it's made in the country? Yes, uh, we are uh, optimistic uh, that uh, the Taliban side, uh, especially when uh, the Taliban leader Mullah Muhammad Omar died, and after that, I think uh, we have seen a lot of changing uh, on the Taliban side, and the Taliban side is now uh, uh, flexible uh, for the peace talks, and uh, I think. Uh, if uh, Afghan government uh, could uh, find a way or could start uh, uh, the direct negotiation with Taliban without uh, <clears throat> the pressure on Taliban from any side, I think uh, we will uh, see a good result uh, on that. Because, but there are uh, the questions Taliban over succession also, when it comes to the, the Taliban. Peace for their country. There are and questions over... We, uh, in, in the previous... Uh, and this uh, uh, July, uh, when we met Taliban in Islamabad, uh, uh, there was uh, interest from Taliban to continue uh, the peace talk and negotiation for the future. But because of some problems, uh, there was some delay. But I am hoping that uh, uh, if we continue the, the negotiation with the Taliban, uh, I am optimistic that uh, we will uh, we will uh, reach to some good result. David, there are questions over the succession when it comes to the leadership. Uh, there are questions, uh, there are statements rather that the movement is fractured now. So, is it clear if the Taliban were to join peace talks, who exactly is going to talk and who they represent? It's not at all clear. Not only are there questions about succession, there's very serious fighting going on among the three Taliban factions main Taliban factions that are striving for power. Mullah Mansour, uh, Mullah Rasul uh, around Herat, and down in Zabul. Uh, there have been fighting that has resulted in scores of uh, deaths and hundreds of wounded. Uh, at the same time, the emergence of Daesh uh, in the Jalalabad Nangahar region, as well as other places in Afghanistan, is a serious challenge to the Taliban's authority. The Taliban is responding by upping its level of violence. The bottom line and the loser in this are the Afghan people. More Afghans have been killed in 2015 than any year ever before. As international forces went down, more Afghans got killed. It would be wonderful if peace talks work. However, I see no evidence from the way the Taliban are acting that they are looking seriously at peace. It looks to me more as if there's going to be multiple civil wars in Afghanistan. And that's why the Afghan security forces need more help from the United States and other countries. Uh, Habibullah, what role uh, can the High Peace Council, of which you are a member, play in any upcoming peace talks? Yes, you see, we, in this uh, previous four or five uh, years, uh, we have a lot of uh, achievement in the peace process. Uh, 
Uh, we met with the Taliban uh, uh, so many times, but uh, uh, this uh, July we met the Taliban uh, directly. Our go main goal was that how to reach Taliban and how to start uh, the official negotiation with Taliban directly. Fortunately, we start uh, that negotiation and uh, that will be our uh, also our uh, goals uh, to reach the Taliban and also to convince them uh, to join the peace process in Afghanistan. And I think uh, that uh, will be uh, the solution for Afghanistan if they come to the political side. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the majority of Taliban now understood the problem of Afghanistan and the future of Afghanistan. And we will try uh, to reach the Taliban and to convince them. And also we will uh, also ask from the world community like before uh, to help uh, us in this process. And I'm sure that the United States of America and also uh, China, they are interesting to help the High Peace Council in Afghanistan in pe uh, negotiation with Taliban. Like we uh, have seen uh, the American or China, uh, they were present in, in the July meeting with Taliban as a uh, supervisors. But, uh, all right, Habibullah, uh, but some people in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Afghani government itself, some government leaders have in fact said that negotiating with the Taliban the, is, uh, and I'm quoting here, a waste of time. So uh, other people do have a different point of view. But just because we're running out of time, Orzala, let me cross over to you. And uh, David, of course, uh, as well as yourself, mentioning the uh, civilians, they are bearing the brunt of this war in Afghanistan, the UN saying uh, civilians, uh, civilian casualties on the rise at an ever increasing pace. More people have been displaced from their homes by the conflict. There is unemployment, corruption not yet overcome. That's a very uh, bleak assessment. Mm -hmm. Well, so it's, it's clear that this uh, situation is, uh, is there. Uh, there is corruption. Uh, we have experienced the highest level of civilian casualties, it's true. But it is not that in the presence of the international troops, we did not uh, suffer from civilian casualties. It will not be true if we say that in the presence of 100,000 of uh, you know, international uh, military forces, we did not face with corruption. Corruption and civilian casualties has been a continuing you know, uh, challenge in Afghanistan over the past you know, decade and a half. Uh, and that's why I am uh, afraid that I cannot share uh, the same point of view with Mr. Sidney when he emphasizes that military is the only solution. Uh, I have seen that war on terror did not have a practical result because we are still, uh, from 2001 onwards, we are still uh, uh, not only facing one type of Taliban, but a multiple type of Taliban. We are, f back in 2001, we did not have suicide bombers. Now we have it every now and then on, 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 on routine basis. We have all these uh, terrible other forces coming up uh, or mushrooming like Daesh or whatever other groups. So if war on terror or if militarization of you know, this uh, a solution for uh, war in Afghanistan was a solution, then why in 14 years we did not reach anywhere better? But now, I am uh, on the other hand, when it comes to Taliban, I definitely agree with the point that the Taliban are extremely fragile. Probably we are at the moment in worse time in Taliban's recent uh, you know, 15 years history uh, to, to, to approach them for negotiations because uh, the, the leader that was supposedly unifying them is no longer there. The new leader is not accepted by all different groups and uh, Afghanistan government will really have a challenging time ahead to ensure that the ones that they are shaking hands with and the ones that are sitting around the you know, negotiation tables are really the ones who have a, a level of monopoly over the violence that they are creating. And, 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 and I do believe uh, that uh, peaceful you know, negotiations is a solution forward. But as I mentioned, the negotiation should be with the right people at the right time. Okay. And uh, with the right people, uh, I would not repeat it again, but with the right people means with the ones who are really the, the monsters behind these actors that are coming to the cameras and to the scene. All right. And, uh, and of course, uh, what we are going to compromise with them is also important. Okay, we'll have to leave it there on that, that note. Thank you uh, very much, Orzala Ashraf Nermat, David Sidney, and Habibullah uh, Fauzi. Thanks for joining us. And Thank you for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on the program's page on our website. That's aljazeera.com. You can also post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also tweet us at AJ Inside Story from myself, the whole team here in Doha. Bye-bye for now.